know, you're not going to go into a fight saying like, okay, I'm going to lose because I got shorter arms and the guy's got a longer reach. No, you have to figure out what your arsenal is and, you know, you play to those advantages. Hello and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 680 with my guest today, Osric Chow. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything that we do, well, check out whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything we're doing. And it's also the place to find our store. And if you use the code podcast15, that'll get 15% off anything you find over there. There's a constantly rotating stock of items, everything from apparel to training products to programs. So go check it out. The show gets its own website, whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. We bring you two episodes each and every week with the goal of, well, we're working hard to connect and educate and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support the work we do, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. Or you could join the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. Patreon is a place where we post exclusive content, and you can get in on it for as little as $2 a month. And if you want the full list of all the ways you can help, as well as a constantly rotating mix of behind the scenes and you know other fun stuff, check out whistlekick.com slash family. Andrew and I had the good fortune of meeting today's guest at Rhode Island Comic Con in 2021. And I knew pretty much from moment one, this was somebody that I was going to have a fun conversation with. And I did. We had a blast. And I didn't do a ton of talking, which is kind of standard for the show. But I didn't have to. Osric just kind of went and he was super open about everything. And what we get is this conversation with someone who built a life with, and I think, to a certain degree, by the support of their martial arts training. I'm not going to spoil anything here. You may know his name and some of the things he's done. In fact, we we didn't name drop any of the things that he's done, so you might want to look him up at some point. But uh, it, it's a good chat. Hello. Hey, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing great, Osric. How are you? sleepy on this side but i'm doing all right <laughs> sleepy did you just get up i did well you know 40 minutes ago but still early. all right you're west coast right yeah i'm west coast yeah that's why yeah <laughs> well thanks for doing it and thanks for being willing to do it early i'm, I'm guessing you're busy so yeah no worries thanks for having me. getting stuff into the schedule I, I i understand how that goes and if you're fitting stuff into a schedule it means you're you're you find some value in it. So thanks for finding some value in what we're doing. Oh, no. Thank, thanks for asking me. It's, uh, it's an honor. And I'm happy to, to dive into some, some topics that I don't normally get to dive into anymore. So Yeah. You know, it's, we found that that's one of the big draws for people who transition into TV film. Like, unless it's, you know, Chuck Norris or someone who is exclusive, maybe not exclusively, but primarily known because they are a martial arts actor. They don't get to talk about their martial arts. That is very true. Which I think is a bummer. Yeah. I mean, considering it, for me, it was such a big part of my life for a while. And, and then after my first job, I, I didn't really do anything that had anything to do with martial arts. You know, at the beginning of my career, it seemed like that was the only trajectory it could possibly go into because that was the only thing I saw. And then mm. the three started to shift and so did the stereotypical Asian characters and they kind of started skewing, not directly at the Kung Fu right. Asian. So it just kind of worked out that way. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably a good thing. I think it is. I think anytime we can, we can blow up stereotypes and broaden perspectives it's a good thing yeah i think so too. and that's actually a subject that's come up on the show a number of times with guests of asian descent that they, they feel like they have so many more opportunities in media now than they did even i mean when was a lot of them identify crazy rich Asians as like the turning point i don't know if you see it the same way I mean, it, it certainly was the tipping point. I didn't think there was a lot of movement happening 
in the years prior to. Sure. Um, I, I remember like the two years before the movie came out, like before anyone knew it was going to be anything. Like there were there were gatherings of Asian American actors all over LA. Uh, and I attended quite a few of them. And, you know, we would just kind of call each other out. Like, hey, why, why, why do we hate each other? Why don't we support each other? Why are we doing this? And it was just like very frank and honest conversation about what we'd all been doing as a community and how we were kind of cutting each other down. Mm. And, um, and so there was a big shift happening already. So when the time crazy, uh, crazy rich Asians came out, we we're all just ready to support it as a community. And it, you know, like we felt like we could not fail with this one. Mm. So it just changed a lot in a big way. It blew up at the box office. I don't think, I don't know if anybody knew it was going to be that big, but it, uh, I, I don't I don't know if you can like you, you hope for the best and sometimes it works out sometimes it doesn't even if the movie's you know amazing it doesn't always work out or even if the movie's terrible sometimes it works out like uh, sure plenty of good. examples of that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> was it that 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 internal dialogue you know among that community was it fear over competing for limited roles that were so profiled yeah i think there is there, i mean there was a lot of issues but scarcity was one of them you know there's so few roles that you can easily do the math if i don't get this one then someone else will get it if that person takes this role over me then that person is my main competition therefore i don't like them or whatever right so there are so few roles that you you could track down every single role that you auditioned for and figured out who got it because there are that few. Yeah. Like I remember I, I had a lot of like Caucasian friends who were actors like in, in the early days of, of LA and like, man, it's like slammed this week. I had like five five auditions today, three yesterday. Like it, it's been like that nonstop. And I'm just thinking like, wow, I'm I'm lucky if I get one a week. Like and like, I don't know there's problems, so I can't mm. really empathize with you. Was the, here, here's a question for some, you know, I'm certainly outside the industry. You know, Caucasian actors, more roles available, but I would assume far more people vying for those roles. Yeah. Was it, a, was it still a more favorable ratio? I I think there, there's so many factors in place. So yes, the pool that you're in definitely makes a big difference. But at the same time, there's different pools depending on your experience, um, the cloud of your agent and manager, where like which rooms they can get you into. Mm. Um, but I would say even from like a manager or agent's perspective, if they know that there are like a hundred rooms they could get you into, even if they can't get you into it, they'll be like, well, I can at least try a hundred times. Whereas for someone in the minority, they're like, okay, well, there are there are 10 rooms that I could get them into. I, I, I have a good feeling that they're going to pop up. So do I want to take on someone that I, that I know is really good, but there's only 10 rooms or someone who's got a lot of potential, but there's a hundred rooms and like, you know, the ceiling is higher, yeah. right? Or I don't have to work as hard. Right. So there's a lot of factors all the way down the line, up and down the line that that go into that, that will kind of be to your advantage or disadvantage. Sure. Anytime anyone talks about advantages, disadvantages, persistence, right? Like as a martial artist, my mind goes to martial arts. And, you know, I looked at what you sent over and, and you said something in here that you also said when we met, you know, that you attribute your time in martial arts to your success acting. Yes. But yet, you know, in, in my notes here, you know, that was not the plan. No. Um, I think at the time when, when I started acting, um, I mean, I fully identified myself as a martial art. I wasn't really an actor. I, I was a martial artist, a co aspiring stunt person who kind of dabbled in acting. And, and I didn't really understand just 
how much of an impact martial arts had on my life at the time, even though I identified myself as a martial artist. Like I, I lived and breathed it. And, and in, in a lot of ways, I, I applied the, all of the, the lessons that I learned in martial arts, the theology, the, just the practices towards mm-hmm. every other aspect in my life. And I didn't really understand it. So I, I didn't really go to university or college. I, well, I went to the University of, of um, in Beijing, the Beijing Sports University, and I studied Wushu. And the one thing I know about uh, being a student is that, I mean, when I was in high school, I was just learning things to regurgitate onto a test and then forget, <laughs> right? Like most and, of us. Yeah. And what I understood of school was that you're supposed to essentially learn how to learn or at least find something that you enjoy doing so that you will, would acquire these things. And I never found that in a subject except for martial arts. And that was the first subject, even though it wasn't really a, you know, your standard subject, it was the first thing that I, I sought out, right? I would go online in like in the early internet days, I would be on these forums. I would look for people who were doing this in my community. I would go to the, the parks and see who was practicing in the morning. Like I was that guy because I wanted to acquire this knowledge that I did not have. And I think having done martial arts for over a decade, I, I finally understood what it meant to learn something. Right. And so when I finally like looked at acting, I'm like, oh, like I never really gave it much credit. I didn't really understand what acting meant or how hard it could be. And I just started applying all of the things. I'm like, oh, it's just another skill that I have to do. And, you know, it, it's such a basic thing, but I, I only approached it from a martial arts standpoint. And I'm like, okay, I have to train here so I can get better here. Right. And then in terms of like, you know, your advantages and disadvantages, like you're not going to fixate on your disadvantages necessarily as a martial artist. Like, okay, if you have shorter arms, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to go into a fight saying like, okay, I'm going to lose because I got shorter arms and the guy's got a longer reach. No, you have to figure out what your arsenal is and, you know, you play to those advantages. So to that aspect, I was always a very positive thinker because I'm like, okay, well, if they're, there's not that many Asian parts, there's not that many Asian actors, then I will stand out, right? So smaller pool. Or because no one's really done it before, then I could be the first, right? So I'm always thinking of the positive uh, aspects of being a minority actor in, in this field that hadn't really created too many careers um, that I could replicate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was a large part of what kept me going was just me looking at this as a craft and not so much uh, who can I follow in the footsteps of. I get that. Okay. <sighs> you're, you're talking about your youth and, and not finding passion in, in academics, but being very aware of passion for martial arts so when 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 someone talks about finding martial arts as a kid there's usually an outside influence you know unless we're talking about youth is you know 16 17 18 you're not driving yourself there most of us aren't blessed to have martial arts schools within walking distance and we usually don't even have the money if if we do so there's a parent there's somebody there that at least tolerated our our interest (laughs) <laughs> What's that early story for you look like? Well, me, I, I have two brothers, uh, younger and older, and we were all very physical kids. We watched like, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles growing up, Power Rangers, all the Jackie Chan, Van Damme movies. My mom could pirate on VHS and and we would just like fight a lot. <laughs> you know, I remember being in like in the schoolyard, I would like, do choreography with the other kids, except they didn't understand what choreography was. And I was just like punching them in the head by accident um, because they didn't know to dodge. Obviously, that's how you're supposed to do it. Don't get hit by my head. <laughs> um, got suspended for that one. <laughs> but the my parents actually did not want to put us into any kind of like karate or taekwondo. 
Um, one, because it was expensive and two, because they thought it was going to make it worse. They thought we were going to have more excuses to get into fights and, and just be more violent. And it wasn't sure. until I think I was, I was 13. My brother was a year younger. Um, so me and my younger brother, we were like, we kept begging, begging. Finally, my mom found in the Chinese newspaper, this, this little ad with some Tai Chi teacher that was offering free, free classes. And I remember she like sold it to us. She was like a used car salesman. And she sold it to us. She's like, oh yeah, I'm like this, this is like, you know, he's like some champion from China, blah, 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 blah. And so we went there and I was like testing the, the teacher. I'm like, oh, okay, like show me what you got. And I, I remember being so cocky. Um, oh, but it's funny, you? like I, I didn't even know what to look for because I, I knew so little at the time. I just, I was just so, I know, skeptical of my, of my mom, I guess. And, you know, he, he did Tai Chi, you know, it wasn't what I was into, but he, and I guess my mom just like kept us there long enough that we finally just started doing things. And, and sure enough, he was a Wushu coach. He was a champion in his youth and, uh, and he came here to teach Wushu and there, there wasn't really that many schools back then. And he was just teaching people at the park. And so that summer, me and my younger brother, we, we trained with him twice a day, every single day, because he just showed up at the park. And so we just went and it, it became an, an, an obsession. And I, I didn't even really know what Wushu was. I just knew that, you know, we we're, we were training. It was just the thought that we were training. It was every training montage that I had seen in every movie. And it was, you know, painful, it was stretching, it was conditioning, it was all these things. And then in the in the meantime, we were doing these forms that I didn't quite understand. I'm like, oh yeah, this is kind of like a Jackie Chan form. Right. So it was like every movie was in the back of my mind as we were training. Um, but I just knew that I it didn't matter how tired we were or how much pain we were in we just kept showing up and then it just became our thing it became our identity like when we got back to school like we were the wushu kids right and then and then at some point we you know our, our community got a little bit bigger we finally went to a competition and we saw like oh wow we're very traditional the, these other kids they're they're doing the competition forms it looks so weird and foreign and it doesn't make any sense and, and then you start looking at it, I'm like okay well it's more of a sport now less of a of a of a fighting you know applications kind of a thing and so you kind of adjust and you know every time you you open up your community and you, you take a another step out into the world you learn something else and it's scary at first and you you hate it and then you're like okay well I guess that's the way of the future and you can either reject it or you can accept it and and find your way in it and we did that so many times as we got into the Vancouver martial arts community and then the Canadian uh, Wushu community. And then at some point we went to China to train to see like, okay, like if, if, if Beijing, China, if that's where like the hub of Wushu is, like I want to, I want to see what the best in the world are doing. Right. So we went there. It was originally a two week trip. I ended up staying for seven months because I, I, I'm like, I just want to do a semester at this university. It's, it's so cheap in China at, at the time. And, and I loved it, you know, and even thinking back to those days, like that was my entire life. I had, you know, I dropped out of school to go to this school. Technically I, I enrolled in school too. Um, but it was, you know, waking up at six every morning, going to eat at the cafeteria for like 50 cents. And then you'd train all morning, you'd have lunch, you'd watch like another class in the evening or in the afternoon. And then, then you train before dinner. And then you just do video reviews, you know, in the evening. And like, that was every single day for seven months. And like thinking back, I'm like, wow, I, 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 don't see myself being able to do that now, just the physical toll it took on me, but it was just really cool that I got to experience that. I'm like, that's how you get good at something yeah. and train at it. And so if I look at any skill that I want to develop today, I'm like, well, if I want to do it, I have to be able to put in the hours. I have to allow myself enough recovery time to be able to go at it 100% again. Am I able to do it? And I'll be able to quickly determine if I 
I mean, if something's worth chasing after, even if I, if I know I have the time for it. Hmm. Anytime we have a, a presentation of something that we're interested in, right? You're in this case, movies, you're watching these movies, you're seeing, you, you've mentioned Jackie Chan a couple times. And then you, you talk about, you know, this, this older instructor who starts off essentially teaching you Tai Chi. And you're like, this is not what I was expecting. But somehow you got from your expectation to at least a reality that you were okay with because you kept going. And not only did you keep going, you got pretty immersive. I, I don't imagine someone says, oh yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to China for two weeks, which turns into seven months. And family is okay with that unless they really see your why, your passion. Yeah, I, I think passion is is the main thing, right? Because my, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but my, I just thought I, I'm like, I do whatever I want. Um, but my parents were very supportive. And I think they just wanted all of their kids to be able to do the thing that, you know, that meant something to them, right? My, my dad always told me, like, if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And yeah. I took that to mean, I'm going to throw that back in your face because I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> turns out he, he actually meant those words. And they saw that we went out of our way in a, in a, to a large margin to do this thing. Um, I mean, and my mom was the one that introduced it to us, so she didn't really say anything. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, I, I think part of it is that there was a discovery. Like, you, you only know so much at the beginning, right? You, there's no way anyone can just, like, know that's that's a destination. Like, that is exactly where I want to go, and this is the timeline. Like, if you know that, like, honestly, that's a superpower. And there are people who, who have that figured out, and I am amazed. And I'm like, wow, they're going to go far because they have that laser focus. For a lot mm. of us, for most of us, I would say, we only have a general direction that we kind of like. And hopefully we like it enough to start moving in that direction. But on that journey, we start to discover things and learn things that we like even more or less. But hopefully there's at least a couple of things you're like, whoa, I didn't even know this was a thing, but that's the thing that I really want to do. It took me five years to get here, but I'm glad I went on this journey because it's all related to everything that I did up until this point. So I think there's knowing that there's that room for discovery was was important. And because every day when I was training, I was I was learning essentially. I was discovering things about the thing that I was doing every single day for, for years. I was still learning more things about it. And there's there's something exciting about that discovery. Mm -hmm. You said five years. Is that that five year mark? Is that from initial exposure to training to coming back from China? Uh, no, it was more like ten. I was mean, just using it as a general. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I mean, it could be however long, right? Like however long it takes you to, to go down that road. Like, I mean, for me, like I hope there's a discovery because if if I know everything that's going to happen, like to me, what's the point, hmm. right? Like, I want there to be an aspect of unknown like i i need there to be something for me to discover because i like if i were to break down my life in terms of purpose and what what i want like i i want to learn things i want to experience things the good and the bad and you know i, I think all of it just helps make everyone a, a more complete person sure what was it like coming back from China. Most of us have no idea what it's like to make martial arts your academic pursuit or your job such that you're doing it that many hours a day. It must have been eye-opening. Uh, it must have left you a different person. Absolutely. Um, so when I came back, well, uh, there, there's quite a bit. I've, I've come back from China, I would say, two times. Like two big times that like completely changed my life. So the first time I came back was after training, and almost immediately I went to the national team trials for wushu. So I made the Canadian national team, and then I got like 
this buggy knee and I had to get it checked out. And I remember the the physiotherapist who just like looked at my knees like I I don't even know like I don't even need to know what you're doing. If you want a future with your knee, you're gonna stop. And he started laughing. I'm like, okay, I guess I should stop training for a while. Mm. And um and he took like six months off. And and it was weird, obviously it was it's such a big change, but I remember like just the first day I took off, um it, it was prior to my plane ride, like I my body just shut down. Right. Because I was in such a state of soreness that I, I didn't even realize it. And the moment I, my body had a chance to breathe and relax, it just like completely shut down for like three days, I think. What and do you mean by shut down? Like I, I couldn't move. I was in so Whoa. much. Pain, okay. Right. And it was like the first, the first day I took off, um, prior to, to me coming back. So I just remember like, that was a shock. I'm like, Oh, okay. Like I probably shouldn't push my body like forward so much. Like I was young, I could do it, but you know, you definitely need some rest period. So that was a big lesson. Um, and then coming back after, after not training for six months, I mean, it was a very different life, obviously very stationary. I watched a lot of people train. I still showed up for classes, you know, it helped teach and coach. Um, but I, I found that I I got better after those six months of recovery because I started training my brain in a way that I never had before. Because previously, and when you go to China, I hope it's different now. Um, but it's the their their um, their Olympic uh, motto is like you know faster, higher, stronger, right? And essentially, that was all like that was the main notes that we ever got in training was like faster, like go jump high, right? Do that faster, you know? Okay. He's stronger here. Right. And like, how do you interpret that? Right. For, for a lot of kids, like I'm only as strong as I am. I'm only as fast as I am. Right. We, we did strength training. We watched these, you know, these incredible athletes and like, how do we do more of what they're doing and we're just like trying to live their life essentially to be faster stronger and and jump higher and all those things and so when i was forced to take the time off i I reflected on that i'm like okay there's got to be a better way there's got to be a faster way and that's when i started like watching all these kids training instead of like just doing it myself and exhausting myself i'm like oh actually there there's a lot to, to to technique that you can adjust that, you know, it's still very traditional. It's still very contemporary, but like I started looking at, looking at it more as like physics and, you know, I started pulling from like gymnastics and all of these other disciplines. I'm like, Oh, if, you know, like essentially there's only, you only have this much time in the air and it really doesn't matter how many seconds it is. It's all a ratio. And I started playing around with like, okay, if we move our legs here to here, this will make your jump here. This will make that twist here. You know, I started thinking of it in physics terms and I, I started piecing it together. And so instead of doing it 10 times, I would just do it like twice and then I would think for a long time and then I would do it the third time and usually I would get to where I wanted or needed to be. And so I think it helped me be a better coach. It helped me be a better athlete and... I think that was probably the, the, a big step for me in terms of, I'm like, I don't need to train harder anymore. I just need to train more efficiently. I have to train smarter. And so I think that was the beginning of me wanting to train my brain because I'm like, okay, I'm 21. At some point, my body's going to start deteriorating. Like, obviously, I want to try to minimize that, but but it's my brain that I have to start training now because I've neglected it for most of my life. Um, so I think that was a big turning point for me, having um, forced myself to take some time off um, just to, to keep my knee for the future. And then the second time I came back, because I, I eventually moved back to Beijing to live for a bit to, to pursue the film industry, it was just a, a different pace of life, right? Like you're in Asia, things move so fast. There's millions and millions of people around you. And when you come back to North America, I think my first reaction was like, wow, it feels like everyone here is moving in slow motion and I'm sprinting. Um, so I think those are the two reactions in coming back. And 
certainly helped shape my life and the way I live it now. Mm. I've caught bits about the approach that China takes to Olympic development, the intensity you've hinted at some of that. Um, my understanding is, is that athletes are selected far earlier there than we're familiar with in most Western countries. Oh, absolutely. And the intensity that, that you're describing, even, even in words, even this slogan, faster, stronger, higher, as you started to consider alternate approaches, you know, being thoughtful and introspective and some self-analysis, was that something you were doing at that time? Or did that have to wait until you came back to Canada? I think, I think a lot of it happened while I was unable to train, okay. right? Again, I think training your mind, like when I was a kid, I, I just didn't really think of it, but like, that was the main thing. Like I, I trained Wing Chun for like eight years and I didn't realize it, but like the whole time, like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm, I'm not the type of person to get into a fist fight. Well, I'm not anymore. Maybe when I was a kid, but like, I'm never, if I do it right, I'm never going to need this. Right. And so the whole time you're thinking, you're just thinking. Right. And, yeah. and I think like that was the biggest thing. Right. Like in China, I, I was thinking of like faster, higher, stronger. I'm like, okay, I just have to be faster. Like, and I was training beside a lot of the kids in the Olympic program for other sports as well. And I, you know, their selection is, well, you have like over a billion people here. And if you're going to select, you know, the ones with the genetic advantage as early as like five years old, sometimes maybe even younger, you put them all in a program if they want, if their parents allow it. And, you know, within that group of kids who have those natural advantages, you introduce them to these sports, and then you find the ones who love it, or who will put up with it and just do it. And then you see out of the thousands who become the hundreds, who become the dozen, who becomes their, the national team, right? Like if you have that kind of selection process, and then, you know, I'm looking at that thinking like, I'm just a kid born the way that I am, wasn't selected in any kind, felt like, you know, this thing chose me to some degree. And I'm like, I have to compete against all of that, right? And I didn't really think, uh, again, this was, this was me thinking like, oh, these are all my disadvantages that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fresh out of art of late. You know, I, I, I don't have this or that or this genetic ability, you know, so, you know, it sucks for me, right? And then when I got back and I was in recovery, I started thinking like, okay, this is where I, this is where I have an advantage and I can do this. Like my brother was taller than me. Like, okay, like I can't compete against my brother who's taller than me in this aspect, but because I'm shorter, I can do this thing a little bit better, right? And you start finding the thing that makes you, you, right? Finding the thing that gives you an edge and you start, you know, sharpening that ax and you go in that direction. We've had quite a few guests on over the years who had some kind of roadblock to the path that they were on. Yours is your knee. And in every case, they've described that experience, that either stopping point, deviation, whatever, forced... I don't know that they would use this word, but I'm going to epiphany around who they are or what they were doing or where they wanted to go. And it almost sounds like that's what you're describing, that had you not had the challenge with your knee, you may not have developed this other, uh, I'm going to call it more insightful approach to training and physicality. Yeah, I... I mean, I think for me, I, uh, I learned fairly early that I, I just can't have definitive goals, like specific plans to like to, to some degree anyways, like you want specific goals and plans, but I guess like the, the grand scope 
the grand master plan. Like I just never had that because things keep changing and I keep learning things that drastically affect it. And so like, you know, I do look at my life as a, as a journey and I'm, I'm on this journey. And as I learn things, like I'll see that, you know, the destination is going to change it slightly. And, and so, you know, I, I've been through a lot of these big epiphany moments. And if I were to attribute any success to myself, it's my ability to, to adapt and change and, and be versatile. Right. And I mean, I, I think as humans, that's what we know how to do. Right. If you get cold, you put on a jacket. If it gets hot, you take it off. Right. But there's this idea that like, oh, I, I don't, it, it's the unknown. I don't know how to deal with it. But to some degree, you don't know until you, you get there and then you'll figure it out. Right. And I, I think I put a lot of emphasis on myself that I will be able to figure it out. So I will always step out into that scary unknown zone and, and wherever it, it leads me, I'm generally okay with it. And I just kind of roll with it, even if it's drastically different than what I set out to do, because I would have learned something that made it make sense for me in the grand scheme of things. And so I, I try not to have any master plan that I would be so devastated if I didn't actualize it, right? Like I have a, a big general goal that I want to do, but there are so many ways of of attacking it that it doesn't matter how I do it, right? The way that it happens doesn't really matter. So I have values that I that I want to aspire to keep. I have. I have challenges and goals that I do want to achieve and succeed in, but yeah, how it happens, it, I don't exactly know. Okay. And I'll, I'll probably discover that as I, I go still. Willing to share any of at least the kind of the directions of those goals? Yeah. I mean, one of my first big goals coming into the end, like when I'm like, oh, okay, I, I want to be an actor. This is the thing I want to do. Um, is that I, I wanted to push for Asian representation. And that, that's something that I've been doing for, for a while now. Um, and at first it was weird because, again, we, we were fighting each other and we would see other Asian actors as competition. And, you know, like I, I struggled with myself there because I'm like, well, how am I pushing for representation if I want? more people to do this, but I also want less people to do it because it would be easier for me to do that first thing. Um, and it was like a weird, a weird thing there until like we finally came to kind of just this agreement. Like, okay, if we if we're just all good and we create more things for ourselves, like then there's room for everyone. Right. And then at some point I just started supporting everyone, even those that I'm like, okay, well, I, if, if they do well and they get this, I, I won't get it. You know, there came a time where I just, I, I'm like, you know what? I'm okay with that. And, and then I realized like, oh, well, we're, you know, now that I'm spending so much time with these guys, like when they're like my best friends, like we're so different that it doesn't make sense for anyone to, to take them over me. It's, they're just a better fit for this thing. Right. So like, even within my own community, I got to know them well enough to know how different we really are and that we aren't, you know, we aren't all the same, even if we are on paper exactly the same. We're just so vastly different how we talk, our mannerisms, you know, the types of people, the vibe we give off, it's so different. Um, so it started mattering less and less whether I, I got the job or not. And then I started doing behind the camera things like producing, writing, directing. And I'm like, oh, I actually really enjoy this. Right. So I'm like, I can attain that same goal behind the camera. And so for me, you know, I'm like, wow, I thought I was going to do it acting. You know what? Don't need to do it by acting anymore. I can do it this way too. And now I'm going into the food industry in, in Vancouver and I'm like, oh, actually there's, you know, having learned the food space now, like there's a lot of things that I can change here in terms of the way people look at certain cuisines and how that's accepted in this city and we can change you know 
the culture in the city by ways of opening certain establishments and, and marketing in a certain way. Right. Like food, you start food, learning. Th- this is a this is a part I, I have zero knowledge about with you. What's what's going on with food? Oh, I, I so I started a couple of restaurants in Vancouver. And, Casual. Uh, Let's start a couple of restaurants. <laughs> I, yeah. I I've worked in a kitchen. I know how exhausting just that aspect of the business is. It, nobody opens a restaurant, at least not successfully, <laughs> on a whim. I mean, this is a big deal. And yeah, it, multiple. Like, where did this come from? It's been crazy, and and the pandemic was like the most insane timing, but. My favorite restaurant in the world is a restaurant called Do Chai in Vancouver. It's a vegetarian Vietnamese restaurant. And as a vegetarian for like 10 years, it, w- it was always hard to find a restaurant that I would recommend or take people to that I liked. Yeah. But this was the first place that I just got so excited to bring anyone and everyone, including especially my carnivorous friends, because we would have a meal and then at the end... I would, I, would, I would just be watching them like, did did you notice that there wasn't meat here? And they're like, what? You know, and they just didn't know. And it wasn't because they had all these meat substitutes or whatever. It's just because it's just a very good meal yeah. that didn't happen to have any meat in it. And like people don't really realize that for, for a lot of the time. And, and that's how the chef kind of like he created it because he's like, look, I, I think most most vegetarian places, they're thinking like, oh, here's a meat dish. And this is how I create that meat dish with vegetables. And he's like, well, like, he's like, I'm Vietnamese. And, you know, if I like look back into my history, a lot of these dishes were all plant-based already. And people just kind of forgot it. So I just took these recipes, like the plants are the star of the show for most mm-hmm. Vietnamese dishes regardless. And, you know, the, the meat's just kind of there. And, he, and he's like, so I just like, went back, found the dishes that I like, put the vegetables up front again. And I just like, you know, seasoned it and prepared it in a way that made people think that it should have meat in it. The flavors are there. The texture is there. It, it's not a meat dish at all. It's not pretending to be a meat dish, but it kind of gives you the memories and the flavors of it because that's what's in our history. And he just kind of built these plant-based dishes from the ground up. And and it 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 is, again, by far my favorite restaurant in the world and turns out the chef I went to high school with and he also went to school for screenwriting so we you know we hung out when we were both in LA doing doing um film stuff and when I came back here I just he's like oh you gotta check out this place like I, I think you'll like it and I just I became a regular there so fast and then like after a year of like going there almost every day He's just like, oh, well, I'm looking to expand. Like, I got this opportunity here, this opportunity there. Like, I don't know if you'd be interested. And I just jumped at the chance. So that that has taken over my life in a weird way. Um, but I'm, you know, it, it's just like part of this adventure, this journey that I didn't expect. I still don't really understand. I know way more about food and restaurants than I ever have. Um, but it it's to that same end, right? Like I can still push for Asian representation opening, you know, Asian ref- restaurants or just giving like chefs who in a lot of sense are artists, like giving them a platform to do what they do. That's kind of the same end for me, mm. just a just a different medium. If someone was to... Well, how about you? If you were to describe you in these varied interests that I I can see ways that they thread together personality wise, um, there's a lot of creativity. But if you were to find a way to describe all of these things that you are passionate about, how would you term it? The thing that I like most about all of the things that I've ever done was it it always comes back to community, Mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're doing the thing that you enjoy and it's supported by a group of people that you enjoy doing it with, like 
honestly, nothing else really matters, right? Like for film, I love that collaboration. And you're not always going to get a good group, but like just the possibility of having like that amazing group together where you have that chance to make magic is like, that's what I'm in it for. Like with my martial arts group, like I love the people I trained with. Like we were best friends. We hung out every, every single day, all day, every day. Right. We just, that was our thing. Right. And then, and then with the restaurant groups, the same thing, like we're all, we're best friends you know, and if you're not, you're doing it wrong because <laughs> you're spending a lot of time together. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just that collaboration of like, okay, like I bring this aspect, you bring that aspect and our powers combined, it becomes a greater thing, <laughs> right? And it's being able to navigate all of the different, like there's so many like pieces and you have to navigate all the egos, all the politics. And, and if you can get through all of that red tape, then again, you have a chance of creating something greater than the sum of its parts. And it's, it's so cool when, when you succeed at that. And, you know, like having done both film and restaurants, I understand why the vast majority of them fail. Um, but at the same time, like I, I like the challenge. I like the unknown and I, I like being able to figure things out. And I, I mean, to some degree, I, I just, have this weird determination to to like just want to bet on myself that I can figure it out where did you get that from I don't know maybe I think maybe my mom something just like stubborn and instill that in you like you you can do this you can figure this out Uh, I know I think it's just like being super stubborn like if someone tells me I can't do something like I'm like I I have Uh. to I have to prove them wrong right like for me motivation like comes in that form of spite i guess i'm like i if someone like the reason why i'm vegetarian is because someone didn't think i could do it (laughs) and that was it (laughs) they they didn't think i could do it and then i just i'm like all right i'll just do it till the end of production which was like a three-month period and i did it i'm like oh that wasn't so bad i'll just keep it going and then and like it wasn't even like that thoughtful of a of a move. It just changed my entire lifestyle because someone doubted me. That was it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of weird if I think about it. But I, I I wonder if any of it comes for you from the same place. It comes for me. We're both smaller people. Yeah. There there's a little bit of a. a yeah, I'm sure we have a chip on our shoulder. Or something. Chi- yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, because people, but I mean, you know, I, mean I, I think I, I, especially like being an actor, like when I started as an actor, every like, no one took me seriously. Everyone thought that it was like, they're like, that doesn't exist for Asian men. Why, why would you even try? Right. And like, what were you trying to do that didn't exist? There were like, when I started acting, there were no careers for Asian men as actors. Okay. Like they're like again, you can think of Jackie Chan gently, you can think of the action stars, but like no one in my immediate circle, my social circle, no one I met knew of any like could name, you know, one, let alone five Asian male actors that had careers as an actor. Right? No one. Every single one of my family members, is like, well, I guess you gotta move to Asia where the Asian roles are, which is why I moved to China. Uh, and you know, to some degree, like I moved back because I'm like, what am I doing here? I, I, yes, I am Chinese, but I don't fit in China. Like it's a very different culture. My values are very different. The type of person that I am is very different. We consume very different media and the type of person that I want to be is not this. And so like moving back, it was like, I mean, moving there, I I learned that I, it is my heritage, but it is not who I am. And so I, I think a big part of my motivation is like, well, I, I just have to prove people wrong. Like, and, I, and I tell people this all the time, especially now that I'm like pitching stories and, and, and projects and stuff. Like people will tell, like a lot of networks or executives will be like, well, historically speaking, like that hasn't done very well. You know, like in our studio, that hasn't very done very well, having this type of person lead that type of movie. And I keep saying like, look, I'm not 
interested in repeating history. I, I want to be someone that makes history. Like, that's it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I can go into all the numerous reasons why those didn't work out. And I think a lot of it is because you only have two examples and you really didn't put much money or effort into it because you kind of wrote it off as soon as you jumped on it. But like, there's probably other reasons than this person, like, it's it's a girl action movie. Like, girls can lead action movies if you do it right. The same way that guys can lead action movies if you do it right. Right. When, when you look back, whenever that's going to be, you know, you, you made a pretty bold statement there. You want to make history. You don't want to repeat it. What does making history look like? Uh, I mean, for me, it just means I'm, I'm not afraid to be the first. Okay. Right? That's all it means. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to go out of my way to like, be the one to do all of these things. Like, I, no, it doesn't matter. I could, I could follow history too. But if my path is taking me somewhere that I'm like, oh, I have to do this thing, and no one's done it before. It's dark and scary because it's unknown. Like to me, it doesn't matter. Then I'll make history. All right. I'm not going to go out of my way to make history. Like I'm going to do what I'm going to do. But if it just so happens that no one's done it, then I will be the first. Right. Like that's all it means. Like I, I don't have to, like I, I don't have like an incessant need to be in the history books or anything. I really don't care. I just, I have, uh, I have goals. I've, things that I want to accomplish. And sometimes those things have not happened yet. I think that's all that means for me. That makes sense. You mentioned that you've enjoyed being on the other side of the camera and that you're pitching stuff and you've done a bunch of things there as well. What, what kind of things are you working on behind the scenes? Any, anything that you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, the the restaurant stuff right now is kind of all-encompassing, but... Like, that always, makes sense. Yeah, I'm always writing, and there's a couple of scripts and projects that I'm shopping around and, and developing, and um, and these things all take time, right? So it, it's nice to be able to get a couple irons in the fire and, and then just kind of focus on the things that you have to deal at hand, and, and then sometimes a random thing will pop up, and you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'm doing that now. <laughs> when when you put these scripts together are you also going to be in front of the camera do you envision yourself as playing one of the roles i've always found that interesting you know when when i talk to actors who also write is that they frequently but not always i I used to i used to solely write for me to act in but i think having directed for the first time just this last year um I, there was just a, a really nice kind of freedom of not being needed in front of the camera. There was like an incredible burden of responsibility on my shoulders, but I kind of, I'm kind of okay with that. So I, I feel like I don't, I don't need to act if I can create stories that I that I know means something to me, then I think that's enough. And however, like being able to act is just another, you know, it's just another way for me to do it. But I can produce, I can write, I can direct. It really doesn't matter as long as I'm, you know, helping tell that story. So yeah, I don't, I don't think I need to act. Like the, the script I'm writing now, I'm, Originally, when I started, I had intentions to act in it, but now I, I don't want to act in it. I, I just strictly want to direct because it's a story that I want to tell. It means something to me, and I would rather make sure that all the pieces line up. And part of that is finding an actor that can do it and knowing my community is growing and is as strong as it is. I don't feel like I have to be that actor because... I'm going to be unable to find someone to do what I need them to do. I have absolute faith that I'm going to be able to find many people that can do what I can do. Mm -hmm. So unless it comes to a place where I'm like, oh, I'm the only person that can be this role. Like that's probably the the time I, okay, I guess I'll act. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
years ago, uh, I think it was for season two of Into the Badlands, I had the chance to talk to Daniel Wu. And that was pretty much his experience. He was like, no, that, that I'm not supposed to be in front of the camera on this one. And if I remember correctly, he described it as they screen tested a bunch of people and none of them worked and the studio kept poking him like, no, this needs to be you. And he's like, fine, I'll do it. And if you've <laughs> seen that show, you know how amazing he did on on that side of the camera as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, sometimes it happens that way, but I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't feel, uh, yeah, it, it's so specific. And I, you know, Daniel, Daniel's been at it for so long. Yeah. Like he, when I moved to China, he was like, he was a big name before, before I, I think when I started martial arts, he was already a big name. <laughs> he's been doing it a long time and yeah. he's, he's awesome. Yeah. He's great. So what's next? You know, you're 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 feeding people, you're writing scripts, you're acting. I'm sure you're not bored, and I'm sure that if you saw a glimmer of light of what most people would call free time, you would fill it with something else. So there's a lot of there's a lot there. <laughs> what it? I think. We, yeah, I think for me, like having that freedom now is is important so for for a lot of artists um like certainly actors at the beginning like you you take what you can get mm -hmm. right and i've been fortunate enough that i've gotten some pretty cool jobs and that i really enjoyed with people that are you know really cool and i think at this point though like i i want to be more picky i don't want to take everything that comes my way i want to you know, I want to dictate the stories that we tell. I want to really have a hand in creating the narratives that that go out into the world that shape how people think. Um, you know, so I, I, I think I see myself more behind the camera than in front of the camera. Like, I don't need to be a public figure. I don't need to have my face everywhere. In fact, I would probably prefer if it wasn't. <laughs> um, and so I think having the restaurants, if I... You know, we're we're still like building up so many things, but if we can set it up right, then I don't have to worry about them so much, and then I can just focus on writing. Then I'll just you know lock my way in a cabin somewhere and just write stories about my family, and, and then nice. try to put them together. Essentially, <laughs> that's what I want to do. One of my favorite questions that I will sometimes ask folks in the film industry: if you get this absolute dream nod from from a studio and they give you like a, a stupidly large budget let's pretend it's there is no budget it's that large and this is the type of of a list film where if you ask someone they're going to say yes what's what's the genre what role in the film are you playing Maybe what's it about and who are you bringing in? I uh, see, it depends on which hat I'm wearing. If it's the director's hat, the producer's hat, or the actor's hat. A any or all? <laughs> I mean, as the, as the actor, um, uh, it's hard not to be basic and, and, and just jump into the superhero space. Um, I mean, I would want to, okay. I would want to do an original something okay. just because I will, I'll probably say sci-fi because I, I don't watch a lot of sci-fi, but I love making sci-fi. Mm. Really not. It's a weird thing. Um, so I would want to do something sci-fi. I know that. Um, if you're, if it's a big suit, the producer in me says like, okay, well, if it's that big, it's got to be action orientated because you can sell that in many markets and you have to be able to recoup your budget. Right. And then you would say, okay, well, then I have to do this big space action, you know, action film, essentially. And then that, that is where my mind will go. And then you end up with Transformers, probably. Um, <laughs> or, like, the director in me says, like, okay, well, I, I, I wanted, like, I just want to do a movie for my parents. I want to do something that honors them, that kind of, picks apart our relationship are very complicated and 
and dynamic relationship and and that is probably a, a five to ten million dollar movie at most and so i guess we'll put it in space and then it'll be a hundred million dollars i don't know <laughs> yeah i yeah that's that's a tricky one that's a tricky one that's a good question what, what about what about other actors? Is there anybody that you hope you get to work with in some capacity? Uh, yeah, I mean, there there's an innumerable number of actors that I would love to work with, but I I think for me, have having jumped in behind the scenes, like now for me, it's so dependent on the story. It is so dependent on the project, right? And I, I don't want to work with someone just for the sake of working with them. Like it's got to make sense. Like I don't want to act in a project just for the sake of it if if i don't fit in to that character or whatever it, it doesn't make any sense and i don't want to be there and part of that is you know for an actor to find your own space within it but it doesn't always make sense and so if it makes sense it makes sense and it, it i think part of the fun of doing these projects that you get to do is that oh it makes sense for all of you to be together on this project right and and there's yeah and that's a weird science in itself but there is there's a there's a joy in being chosen like oh you're acknowledged you're acknowledged to be part of this group so there's a lot of outside gratification coming in that Makes me want to be on the other side of the camera too. <laughs> I think yes. Okay. Nice. Well, this this has been awesome. We'll we'll wind down here. If people want to get a hold of you, social media, anything like that, you can share. Uh, yeah, at Osric Chow, I haven't been very active. <laughs> Building restaurants is like an insane process, and not the most glamorous. So it's, it's not even like oh, I want to take pictures of rubble to share. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't, Rubble. Know, yeah. Rubble. I don't know. Like sometimes, you know, when you're building it up, it's like, okay, we got to build the foundation. Like, yeah. Now we're pouring concrete. And now we're like putting tables together. D you know what? <laughs> if I may, don't yeah. underestimate people's interest yeah. in the behind the scenes and the build up. Fair enough. Fair enough. There, there's just so much happening. And most of the time, I'm like, oh man, I, I wear the same shirt for like five days in a row because I'm just too tired to change and I got to. You know, I'm like in an office, like I just go to the office and do paperwork. I'm like, paperwork is not sexy. I don't want to show people how to do QuickBooks because I barely understand it. And I I'm laughing it. from understanding, not yeah. because I'm I'm mocking you. I I, I get it. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm learning. I I feel like I'm adulting for the first time. It's not it's not it's not the most fun. Like I I appreciate what it's doing for me as a person, but like I also hate. It. <laughs> we all want it as a, as a kid we're like oh i can't wait to grow up and then we grow up and we're like yeah. oh man i just want to take a nap and have someone give me snacks oh, i would love that again isn't it yeah just yeah, that would be the best appreciate my mom for that that's my life at home if i live there nice <laughs> final um, words for the folks listening what do you want to leave them with uh, I know, and I'm, I'm just tired now. It's like seven a.m. <laughs> no, like thank, thank you for, thank you for listening. Thank you for um, giving me a voice, and 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 I appreciate all of you. Very simple. There's a pretty good chance that you had a similar reaction to mine in my conversation with Osric. This is someone who. I don't think accepts boundaries, at least the limiting kind, and just goes for what he wants. It's a powerful sentiment and one that I find incredibly motivating. We've talked to absolutely wonderful people on this show, and we continue to do so, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. What I found different here, though, was the breadth of things that he's involved in simultaneously. And that's something that we don't get too often. And it's something that I can appreciate because I, I think it's a way that I might describe myself. Lots of different stuff going at the same time. I hope that you will check him out in all the various places you might. We still haven't 
talked about the things that he's done, and I kind of want you to go look stuff up if you don't know him by name. Because I think you'll be impressed. I, I certainly am. Osric, thanks for coming on the show. Really had a good time. Really appreciate your generosity with your time and your openness with saying all the great stuff you said. If you want to go deeper, find links, photos, all the good stuff related to this episode, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you're up for supporting us in the work that we do, well, you've got a lot of options. You could leave a review, maybe buy a book on Amazon, or help out with our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. If you want to bring me to your school for a seminar, I'd love to join you. Reach out and we'll find a way to make it happen. And remember, you've got the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off a shirt or some gear or anything else at whistlekick.com. You know, we'd love to hear your guest suggestions. And our social media is at whistlekick. My email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Feel free to reach out. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.